Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the lunchtime program of the Literature Lovers. We are thrilled to have you with us today. We'd love to see where everyone is tuning in from, so please feel free to type your location into the chat box. There's a chat icon at the bottom of your screen, and that will pop up a chat box on the side of your view, and you can put in where you are tuning in from. I'm sure we have a lot of Minnesota fans today for Mary Sherritt and Elisa Elliott. Yep, there we go. Marine on St. Croix is our first one. Thank you, Yay. Nancy, Michelle. Michelle. One of your friends, huh? Yay. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> wow, we've got people already from all over the place. Cool. Yay, great. Linda. Oh, Linda's in Houston, <laughs> yay. Yay. Lots of people, wonderful. Yorkshire, England must be one of your friends, Mary. Yeah. <laughs> South Carolina, lots of Minnesotans. Yay. Wonderful. Ah. Well, we'll give people just a couple, a minute or two to finish tuning in. We've got 59 of us live right now, but we Ooh. had 85 registered. So we'll give them just a couple more minutes to tune in. But I'll introduce myself while we're doing that. Welcome to Literature Lovers at Lunchtime. I'm Pamela Klinger Horn, and on behalf of my two partner bookstores, Valley Bookseller in beautiful Stillwater, Minnesota, and Excelsior Bay Books on the banks of Lake Minnetonka in Excelsior, Minnesota. Thank you for joining us today. We're so thrilled and honored to be presenting Mary Sherritt the author of the new book, Revelations, in conversation with Elisa Elliott, who is the author of the novel, Eve. So we are going to get started here. Elisa is very kind to join us today to be in conversation. Her novel, Eve, blends biblical tradition with recorded history to put a powerful new twist on the story of creation's first family. Elliot boldly reimagines Eve's journey before and after their banishment from Eden and her complex marriage to Adam. Eve explores the very essence of love, womanhood, faith, and humanity. Elisa is joining us today, as I said, from her home here in Minnesota. Elisa's research and writing made her the very first author to pop into my mind when I was looking for a conversation partner for Mary today. And I'm really excited to hear what their discussion reveals. Mary Sherritt is no stranger to Minnesota readers. She is also originally from Minnesota, but now makes her home in Portugal, where she is tuning in from today. So that's why we're doing it at noon, because it is 6 p.m. for Mary. So she has been a longtime favorite among booksellers and customers. Mary usually appears at her live events in costume, but we're just very <laughs> thrilled to have her through the magic of Zoom today. Those of you who enjoy historical fiction know that Mary's a meticulous researcher and richly detailed portraits of women are her specialty. And she looks at women who are often overlooked by history, and that is history with a capital H. So I met Mary back when she published The Vanishing Point, set in 17th century Maryland. She next had readers bewitched with her cunning women in The Daughters of Witching Hill. After that came her best-selling novel, Illuminations, about the life of Hildegard von Bingen, a cloistered nun. Mary then returned with the Dark Lady's Mask about Shakespeare's muse and the poet Amelia bassano Lanye. Her eighth book was Ecstasy. This is a gorgeous and illuminating tale of the composer and muse Alma Mahler. Now Mary returns to the world of religious women with her work of historical fiction, Revelations. It's being called a 15th century eat, pray, love. Revelations illuminates the lives of two female mystics, Marjorie Kempe and Julian of Norwich. Revelations does not arrive in stores until April 27th. We are very fortunate, however, to have Mary with us today to give us an early insight into the book. If you are as intrigued as I was with Revelations, you can pre-order it after the program. I will be putting links in the chat box for both Valley Bookseller and Excelsior Bay Books, and you can just copy and paste those into your browser and put them into your shopping cart very easily afterwards. 
So Mary and Elisa are now going to discuss revelations and they'll be taking audience questions. So if you do have questions, please enter it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen rather than the chat box. It's easier to sort through there. So please enjoy this conversation about revelations and take it away, Mary Sherritt and Elisa Elliott. Thank you. <laughs> Mary, I am so excited to interview you. This is your first big event for this book. And I'm just so excited to be the one that gets to interview you. Um, oh, I'm... Everyone that's joining us, it's amazing. It really is. The book is uh, so well thought out and detailed and intriguing. And it's the best sort of book in the sense that it asks more questions than it answers, to me anyway, it, but, it, but in a good way. I, I want to know more. And I think that's what this whole book is about and, um, and this whole event is about. So I'm going to ask Mary just a couple questions. And then if we run out of time, I have a whole list more of questions I can ask you. And if you have any questions, like Pamela said, please put them in the Q&A. If you'll go down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little Q&A. And then we'll kind of keep tabs on them as we go and then be able to ask Mary. So, all right. Uh, Mary, can you tell us more about your mission to write women back into history? Thank you. Well, thank you for asking. First of all, I want to say what an honor it is to be here in conversation with you, Elisa. And I'm so grateful to Pamela Klinger Horn and Valley Bookseller and Excelsior Bay Books for sponsoring this event. It's a great honor to be here with you all. So, I'm on a mission to write women back into history. That's my motto as an author, because I believe to a large extent, women have been written out of history, their lives and stories lost to us, no matter how accomplished they were. So I want to write novels about these lost women and put them and their accomplishment center stage. Now, Marjorie Kemp, the heroine of my novel, Revelations, is a special case in point because she was nearly wiped from the historical record entirely. She disappeared for centuries. Nobody knew anything about her. And she only came to light due to bizarre incidents that took place at a country house party in Derbyshire, England in 1934. So at Southgate House, a stately home owned by the Butler Bowdens, a long established member, you know, family of the nobility, a group of bright young people were having a ping pong party. So imagine these like upper class people, excuse me, playing ping pong. One of them accidentally stepped on the ping pong ball and destroyed it. So they went through the cupboards in search of another ping pong ball. What they found instead was a bunch of really old leather bound manuscripts. And one of these was the book of Marjorie Kemp, which was written between 1436 and 1438. And it proved to be the first autobiography written in the English language. As serendipity would have it, one of the ping pong players was also a medievalist, Hope Emily Allen, and she translated this book from Middle English into Modern English to great acclaim. It was an instant publishing sensation because Marjorie is so unique and quirky, she exploded every previously held stereotype about medieval women. She was not only a desperate housewife and mother of 14, she was also an entrepreneurial businesswoman, a globe-trotting pilgrim and independent traveler, and a suspected heretic and itinerant preacher. When on trial for heresy, where a guilty verdict would have seen her burned at the stake, she kept her spirits high by entertaining the Archbishop of York with a, a parable of a defecating bear and a priest. You can't make this up. <laughs> so Marjorie's story would have been truly and irrevoc revocably lost if she hadn't recorded it in her autobiography, which was a tremendous act of foresight and courage that made her a literary pioneer. She dictated her story to a priest who wrote it down for her and his ecclesiastical authority gave her narrative gravitas. 
Um, even Julian of Norwich, who also is a major figure in the book, we think of her as an icon, like she's always been there, but she was nearly written out of history too. There were very few copies of um, Revelations of Divine Love, her book that survived. That incidentally was the first book in English written by a woman, Revelations of Divine Love by Julian of Norwich. So she fell into complete obscurity and only surfaced again in 1901 with Grace Warwick's modern English translation. And that book was such a hit, it influenced T.S. Eliot, who quoted Julian of Norwich at the end of his poem, Little Gidding. While Marjorie and Julian's stories are, are well known to theologians and medievalists, that's not enough in my opinion. I think they should not be the preserve of some academic elite in, a, in an ivory tower. I wrote my novel to make their lives and work accessible to a, a wide general audience. And anyway, Marjorie was a very earthy character and she wouldn't want to be in some ivory tower. She'd mm -hmm. want to be down in the tavern drinking beer with you all. That's so true. Can you even imagine being the ping pong players though? And then to be a med medievalist and to discover that, oh my gosh, it would have been so exciting. Yeah. I just, all these little tidbits are so that it, it just makes it more fun to read the book. So, oh, cool. everyone has to read the book. Okay, so my second question is, you've written about a wide variety of women in history, from Renaissance poet Amelia Bassano Lanier, or Lanier to 20th century composer and muse Alma Mahler. But one theme that seems to be keep cropping up in your novels is your enduring fascination with women's experience of the visionary and sublime. You've written about the mystic abbess, Hildegarda Bingen, about the otherworldly ecstasies of the Pendle witches in 1612 in Daughters of the Witching Hill, and your new novels about two women mystics, Marjorie Kemp and Julian of Norwich. Can you discuss what keeps drawing you back to the theme of women's visionary experience? Well, women's spiritual experience and visionary experience is, is definitely a theme that keeps popping up in my novels. One thing that kind of um, really kind of gets me going as a spiritual person myself, I've always found it how I've always found it so frustrating that women have been sidelined and kind of marginalized by every institutional religion in the world. And even in alternative spiritual movements, there are scandals about male teachers and group leaders that overstep their power and so forth. And I think a lot of women struggle to find spiritual community or a spiritual kind of path that seeks to the, that speaks to their individual experience as women. A lot of it was, you know, created by and for men. And uh, a lot of women end up kind of on their own as solitary seekers, but they're not really alone because they follow in the footsteps of a long line of female mystics who rejected this kind of abject obedience to male authority figures to contemplate the deep mysteries of the soul on a path of inner revelation. Instead of looking to the outside, they look to the inside. And I find that kind of the essence of women's spirituality, looking within and finding the divine answers there. And I would even define mysticism as a female path. The Cambridge Dictionary defines mysticism as the belief that there's a hidden meaning in our existence, that every human being can unite with the divine. And the American Dictionary states that mysticism is a belief that it's, po that it's possible to receive truth or achieve communication with the divine through prayer and contemplation. And some of the most famous mystics in the Western spiritual tradition have been women like Hildegard who plunge deep within their own souls for spiritual guidance and emerge with ecstatic prophetic, 
prophetic and radical insights. And incidentally, this is true for women of all religious traditions, for, for Hindu women, for Buddhist women. There, there are women mystics in every religion on the planet. But medieval Europe is particularly interested, interesting for me because it saw the rise of many female mystics, including Hildegard. And there were whole kind of women's spirituality movements arising then that a lot of people nowadays don't know about. In the um, beginning in the 1300s, more or less, a group of women, uh, sort of a, a women's spirituality movement arose called the Beguines. They were not nuns, they were secular women who gathered together kind of living in commune like settings, all female communes, and they lived independently. They worked um, at some industry or other, the ones who appear in my book, Weave Linen, to support themselves. And they weren't, um, they didn't belong to any religious order. They had no abbess or abbot telling them what to do. They were completely independent. And some of them didn't even live in these communities. Some were kind of itinerant and so forth. So they're completely cool and interesting. And they endured long past the middle ages. Um, fun fact, the last begin in the world a woman named Marcella Patton died on April 14, 2013, age 92 in Kortrijk, Belgium. Just weird fun fact. But back to the Middle Ages, <laughs> one of the most idiosyncratic mystics of the late Middle Ages was neither a nun nor a begin, but Marjorie, a desperate housewife, mother of 14, and failed businesswoman from Bishop's Lynn in Norfolk, England. And I think that Marjorie's story offers plenty of inspiration for those of us today who want to reclaim our spirituality while living ordinary secular lives because she wasn't a nun, she wasn't cloistered. She was literally all over the map exploring the whole world. And she lived her mystic's path in the full stream of worldly life with all its wonders and perils. Oh, that's, that's amazing. And I think too, it's important to note that when we're living those lives, we are seen sometimes as other right? We, we yes. don't fit into the general population, really. Yes. So it's so nice to speak to other women who are experiencing the same thing in the middle of laundry and whatever they're doing, you know? Yeah. So I think that's what's neat about Marjorie and that you found her in that condition because that's what she was. She was a desperate housewife yeah. you know, <laughs> wanting to get out, you know? Yes. <laughs> so yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's move on to our third question. Like us today, the medieval mystics Julian of Norwich and Marjorie Kemp live in a time or lived in a time of pandemic and social unrest. What can they teach a modern secular audience about coping in these troubled times? Well, Marjorie and Julian lived in the age of the bubonic plague, which was probably the worst pandemic ever recorded. The plague was certainly the defining experience of Julian's life. She didn't start off as a religious woman, but only entered her vocation at the age of 30. In the Middle Ages, generally, if you became a nun, you started off when you were a teenager. So she was a late bloomer in that respect. We know very little about her early life before the age of 30, but we do know that the plague came to Norwich three times before she turned 30. And it's possible that she had a husband and children and lost her entire family from the plague. So it was absolutely devastating. It just, you can't imagine how many people were lost and how many families destroyed from that. And because of the, the institutional religion of the day preached this strong message of hell and damnation. So not only were people terrified of illness and dying and losing their whole family. They were also afraid that they and their loved ones would end up in the wrong place and burn forever in hell. 
So Julian was obviously in despair, and that's the whole background to her journey. In uh, Revelations of Divine Love, she explains how she was in such a down state that she prayed to become so ill, she would touch the brink of death so she could see what lay beyond. And that's what happened. She was in a near death state and she had a series of visions. And what she saw in her visions was a divine love that was so deep, it could completely transfix our most profound earthly suffering. Her visions made such an impact on her that she spent the next 40 years of her life unpacking them. She went from a secular woman to joining, to becoming an anchorite. So effectively, she chose of her own free will to be bricked into a cell built on the back of a church. And she spent the rest of her life there, bricked into this one room to devote her life to prayer and contemplation and writing about her visionary experience. I show um, uh, anchorites in my novel Illuminations as a young woman, Hildegard was interred with her uh, spiritual superior Jutta von Sponheim, but for Hildegard, it was a terrible kind of experience, but Julian chose it of her own free will. So she, um, she spent the next 40 years writing through luminous theology of an unconditionally loving God who is both mother and father, who is completely without wrath, who can't damn a single soul. It's radical stuff that arose directly from her grief and confusion and devastation that arose from her pandemic. Um, to give you a taste of this, I could read you a really brief excerpt yes, from please. the book. Yes. Cool. And I promise it won't be too long. Okay. So um, Julian is uh, talking to Marjorie and explaining all this to Marjorie. That's the context. In my despair and longing for comfort, I begged God to bring me to the brink of death so I could look beyond that veil into the next world. God answered my prayer. I was at death's threshold when I received the showings. They were so real, Marjorie. I saw our Lord's passion. I felt his hot blood dripping on my face. And then he opened up his heart and showed me what lay inside. I saw such love, endless love. It was so vivid, it ravished my heart. I lost myself in him. Her words left me swaying. What's more, she said, in all he revealed to me, I saw neither sin, nor blame, nor wrath, nor even hell. I could only conclude that sin has no substance. It cannot be discerned at all, save for the pain it causes for a time. In this sense, you could say even our failings and mistakes are necessary, for they serve to purify us and make us know ourselves and ask for mercy. Think of this, dear Marjorie, all our trials and anguish our tastes of Christ's passion, but behind the reality of our deepest suffering lies the mystery of God's love. Know that all is well. Her words lifted me to such a high place that I could gaze down upon the world as though it were a map. I was lifted higher and higher until I could behold this precious tender world and all the starry heavens nestling like a hazelnut in God's palm. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. you know, that reminded me, um, I actually wrote it down when I was reading. Julian says something along the lines of, friars and priests speak of hell, so they can't suffer my book of love. And I think that's so true because she was reaching out. She knew God was love. She knew that it didn't have anything to do with what was being believed then you know yeah this very punitive harsh yeah. punishing vision of yeah. the divine but i have to say 
that it's a very modern problem as well. So we yeah. haven't learned anything. <laughs> no. <laughs> so that's, I think, what is so neat about your book is everything you talk about in your book. Yes, it was based in, in history, but we, we suffer from the same things today. We suffer from the same complexes about faith or religion or no religion or trying to find spirituality with secularism. It's, it's, um, yeah. it, it's a very real struggle today, which makes your book so timely and so fresh, I think. So, Thank you. Yes. Okay, so we do have one or two questions, but I'm going to wait until after I ask this question here. Um, uh -huh. And if anyone has questions or answer or questions, not answers, but questions, um, please put them in the question and answer section below and we'll get to them soon. Uh, Mary, what are some of your favorite or, or surprising facts about Marjorie and Julian that you learned while doing research for the novel? Okay, there's a number of really fascinating synchronicities that connect the two women. In so many ways, their stories intertwine and complement each other. Marjorie was born in 1373, the same year that 30-year-old Julian received her showings, her divine visions that would inspire her to write revelations of divine love. Um, both women lived in Norfolk, uh, the county in Eastern England, in cities less than 45 miles away from each other. Marjorie and Bishop's Lynn, which is now King's Lynn, and Julian, obviously, in Norwich. Both women were literary pioneers whose life work was lost to obscurity, only to suddenly appear again in the 20th century when we were hopefully evolved enough to <laughs> accept it and take it to heart. Um, like us today, they lived in a time of pandemic and great social upheaval. And they, ch um, they chose very different spiritual paths um, Julian as an anchoress and Marjorie as this uh, lifelong pilgrim and itinerant, um, I would even say if she had a ministry, I'd call her a, an itinerant minister. But most important of all, they were not isolated from each other. They supported each other. When Marjorie was having her crisis of faith, you know, she'd left her husband and children to go on pilgrimage because that was the only way she could escape, which for her was a soul destroying marriage, but it was it was a, a radical choice then it would be now too to suddenly leave your husband and children to wander the world I mean she'd have a hard time now too. So she went to Julian for counsel and you think Julian is at least outwardly much more kind of. Um, you know, orthodox than, than, Ju uh, than Marjorie, kind of, you know, you have to do things the right way, blah, blah, blah. But Julian said, you know, listen, trust the voice of your heart and don't worry too much about the world thinks. If, if some people dislike you, that's probably a sign that you're doing something right. <laughs> yes, it's true. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a few, I, I don't want to be remiss in not asking you what I think most people would want to know, sure. at least I would want to know. So um, I'm going to ask you about um, your, you went on partial pilgrimages for this book. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me about that? And was that experience useful for writing this book? Because I think that's something that people would want to know. And then I will get to people's questions and the thing. Because I think that's something, when you're reading it, you're like, wow, you know a lot about all of this oh. stuff. And how much of it was personal that you actually went through? All right, yeah, that was the most exciting part of the research. I love my research and I really throw myself into research with both uh, feet but this was the first book that made me wear out a pair of hiking boots. <laughs> so um, in England, I, I um, went on part of the pilgrimage route to Our Lady of Walsingham in Norfolk. It's, um, it would have been a day's horse ride from where Marjorie lived in Bishop's Lynn. And uh, it was an interesting experience. A lot of people were on pilgrimage there. It was um, in autumn and the, the hedges were heavy with hazelnuts dropping to the earth. So there were hazelnuts everywhere. And that made me think of Julian's analogy of the hazelnut. So that was really exciting. Um, then I went to Canterbury. I went to uh, Rome. 
not I didn't walk there on foot, but I, I went there with an airplane and toured the <laughs> sacred sites of Rome. And I didn't make it to Jerusalem. That's the only one I didn't make it to. Hopefully one day I'll get there. And uh, I went um, part of the pilgrimage uh, to Santiago de Compostela, which is amazing. Um, I did a few days of the walk. I didn't do the whole, um, the whole pilgrimage. But it was amazing, just the fellowship on the Camino and all the little kind of impromptu cafes and restaurants where you have lunch before you walk on again and all these people that spontaneously talk to you and seeing all the different people walking. There were young people, old people, fit people, people that looked like they couldn't walk another step. You know, it was just an amazing diverse group of people. And then when you get to the cathedral of Santiago, you know, that's the culmination of the pilgrimage. Um, everyone is welcome to this mass. And, the, you know, there are people of all different faiths and backgrounds and religions, and not everyone is walking it for religious or spiritual reasons anyway. But everyone was welcome welcome there and then the priest said there's no false reason to go on pilgrimage we're all searching for something and i thought yeah. that was such a welcoming thing to say in our we live in such a divisive world but just to have that kind of welcoming and homecoming was beautiful oh that's lovely no i i knew people would be interested about that i mean i i was interested i was instantly thinking oh my gosh she must have done the whole entire thing because how could she have done that much research but there's there's places that you can go for all of this stuff too but it requires a lot of research and a lot of time and a lot of yeah, effort so yeah yeah, yeah I, I went to norwich definitely and there's um you can visit a reconstruction of julian's anchorage um, her name was not Julian. She took the name. She was so self-effacing. She took the name from the church uh, yes. that her cell was built on, St. Julian's Church. So that church was destroyed in the Second World War. And so what is there now is kind of a reconstruction of it. And uh, they, they also have her reconstructed anchorage. But um, before COVID, at least, you could go there and you could sit in there and meditate or contemplate. And uh, it was a very peaceful place. And there's also the Julian Center right next to the church. And mm -hmm. I'm a member of the Friends of Julian. They're lovely people. It's a wonderful kind of research center. They have books and multimedia um, resources. And it's a, and if you come in, they just give you tea and cookies and stuff. It was really fun. It's like Christmas for a writer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so going to the questions, we have we have just have a few so far. So um, people, please put your questions in. This is prime time with Mary. You can ask her anything. <laughs> um, Linda, I think you know Linda White, but she says, Yay! hello, Mary, I have a question for you. Which of all these many heroines that you've written about is perhaps the one you would most like to sit down to tea with of those that were real people? And then what would you have for that tea? Oh, wow. Well, I'd like to I'd like to have a big tea party with all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, yeah, Marjorie, I think she'd like a glass of mulled wine. And I think she'd like a nice uh, spice cake. Mm. A nice medieval spice cake. That sounds delicious. Yeah. Um, and then Kath um, asks, what would Marjorie be doing? if she were alive in our times? That's a really interesting question because um, she could only really break out of her kind of desperate housewife mode by using religion as her vehicle in her time because divorce was not an option. Um, she couldn't just walk away from her family without having a higher purpose as an excuse. Um, without saying that she had been called by God. So I think now in the secular world, if she wasn't a spiritual person, she would just get a divorce and become a traveler, a world traveler. But I think she was such a spiritual person. She would still be spiritual in her way. 
but she wouldn't feel such a desperate need to get that validation maybe that that Marjorie did in history. Yeah. No, I, de I definitely have felt that felt that desperation. I think whenever you're a mother, I'm, I'm not speaking for everybody because I don't know how everybody feels, but from a lot of my friends, um, you get that feeling of like you're drowning, I think. Yeah. And when you do have a heart for more, a heart for maybe helping other people or a wider worldview, it, it makes you feel like you're stagnant for many years. You know, even though yeah. you know you're raising a child or raising children, but it it is, I think it would be just as um, mind blowing for her to do what she did then to do today because she yeah. left a, a small child, like she was leaving small children behind, yeah, and having her older children take care of them, and you know, and that was I people would look down on that today too oh yeah you know? she would she would we would accept her divorcing her husband but leaving her children that yeah. would be a big um people would shun her for that right today, I think but then I think yeah. you you follow her in her heart and she desperately wants to do the right thing but she has this thirst right that she cannot ignore yeah. and I think that's what's so beautiful about the book, yes, you describe amazing scenes, you describe amazing people, but you really get to the heart of what I think many women feel, whether you have a children or not, you feel like you're pushing against something. Yeah. And um, constantly. Yeah. You know? And I don't, I don't know if men feel the same way. I don't think they do. I think their doors are opened for them. But for women, especially, it's harder, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me see if I have any more questions here. Oh, I do. Yay. Yay. Um, okay. So Sandy asks, how long did it take you to write this book? Um, about three years, three and a half years. Okay. Yeah. Long time. Did it ever feel like it was getting too long or did you think, no, I'm, I'm on track? I, yeah, it was getting very, very, very long. And I, I usually, my right, there are people from my writer's group here. So Kath and Anjum are going to nod along. But I usually write like this supernaturally long novel that's like, you know, everything in the kitchen sink. And then I yeah. go and cut, 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 cut. And uh, sometimes radical cuts. So I think... Um, the, the draft that many people read was at least 100 or 200 pages longer than the version that was published. I mean, by the time I get it to my editor, you know, it's uh, usually a bit more streamlined. But when I'm doing my first draft, it's like, you know, everything gets thrown in there. Yeah, that revision's hard work. It really is. At least yeah. for me, it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Kate asks, um, how do you consistently find obscure, forgotten women to write about? I, I do lots of reading about of history, and um, I discovered Marjorie in a class on late medieval belief and superstition, um, and that was really fun. But yeah, I'm always reading about history, um, always researching. I'm just fascinated, and I can't get enough of it, and, and these characters come out and grab me. And <laughs> That's great. Um, okay, Erin asks, which of your characters can you see living in 2021 and how would she contribute to our world? That's sort of the same question, although you might be able to flesh it out a little bit more during the pandemic and how would she connect with women? All right, well, I think uh, Julian would be great during the pandemic because she already had the social isolation thing down pat yeah. because she was yeah. an anchoress, but she, she was, you know, kind of apart from the world because she had her anchorage. She was a recluse, but she was deeply connected with her world because there was a window in her recluse or in her cell where people could come and ask for counseling. So she, would, uh, she wouldn't be at her window of today. She'd be on her Zoom screen talking with the whole world and uh, sharing her wisdom and counseling people. So I think she would be totally the best person to take hold your hand and get you through this pandemic. Oh, that's what we need. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so Nancy asks, what was Julian's relationship with the hierarchical church? So what was her, and what was her birth name? Oh, Marjorie's birth name was Marjorie. 
No, Julian, sorry. Oh, Julian, no, okay. Julian, um, nobody knows what her birth name is. So she, she took the name Julian from the church where her cell was built, but nobody knows what her real name was or okay. her surname. So that none, nobody knows that. Um, her, um, she was a Benedictine nun before she, first, she didn't become an anchorite right, right away. First, she had to take the orders of profession as a Benedictine nun. Then she became an anchorite and then she was enclosed. She doesn't talk a lot about her relationship to the hierarchy. Um, she, in her book, um, she says, anything here that seems extreme or radical is nothing more than my visions and my faith taught me. And she said she believed in Holy Mother Church and so forth. Her book was kind of um, radical in that it, this emphasis on love and she talks about Mother God. On the other hand, 300 years before her, Bernard of Clairvaux was talking about Christ the mother and Hildegard of Bingen was talking about God as mother too. So there were people in the church before her that including men speaking about the feminine aspect of God. So she, that wasn't the most radical thing, but her thing that there's no wrath, there's no hell, yeah. or at least she was very uh, careful not to step over the boundary of, of um, heresy. So she didn't say there is no hell. She said, I did not see it. Yeah. All I could see was love. I didn't see wrath. I didn't see hell. All I could see was this love. Right. Um, I think I, I think I saw one disappear just now, but um, so we won't get to that one. Just a real quick, um, you'll have to explain who Miss Boo is because Anne is asking, does Miss Boo speak Portuguese yet? Oh, okay. Miss Boo is my pony, my Welsh pony. She came with me all the way from Lancashire, England to Portugal. She's in the field behind my house. Unfortunately, I can't bring her in for the camera, but she's very photogenic. And if you saw her, you would all fall in love with her. And she has a field mate, a nice uh, a Portuguese Lusitano horse called Zinco. And he's a very handsome boy. And he's teaching her to whinny in Portuguese. Oh, okay. So, and then Michelle added to that, did Miss Boo enjoy her silver birthday? Oh, yes. She, uh, she got to, to go to her meadow with the really long grass and oh, stuff herself good. with really yummy grass. <laughs> Lisa, the reason that the question popped off was because I wanted to give it a little introduction. We had a question from another his author of historical fiction, Janet Graber, and her novel is actually a wonderful young adult companion to Mary's yeah. work called The White oh. Witch. And um, I've had the pleasure of knowing Janet for a while. She is originally from England, but lives here in Minnesota. And her question for Mary was, you talk so convincingly of belief in God. Do you have strong sense of the divine or were you writing pure fiction? I have a, I'm a very spiritual person. I'm not like, I hope I'm not like this kind of crazy religious nutcase person, but I would say that I am a spiritual person. I try to meditate every day. I have a strong kind of longing for spiritual connection. Okay, and do you find that in Portugal? Do you have anyone else you find that with? That's my personal question. Um, like a spiritual community? Yeah, or yeah, or is it very lonely in that quest? Um, well, I just moved here in, last July during COVID. So with all the COVID restrictions, yeah. obviously, I think after the COVID restrictions, it's gonna be a lot easier to connect with people. But uh, yeah, it's uh, the uh, life here in COVID was quite strict against gatherings and stuff, yeah. but I think that's gonna resolve itself. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to save Michelle's. She, Michelle had one other question. I'll save that just for a little bit because I think that's more what you're working on now. Uh, Kate or Keta, I'm sorry. I think it's Keta, Keta. Uh, Mary's, what I find amazing is how you managed to write this book while moving house and horse. Which was harder to research, your new book or your new home? 
Yeah, it was it was quite a challenge moving from the UK to Portugal during a pandemic. We we bought the house and made the down payment before the pandemic when nobody thought it would happen. You know, it, no, it, before anybody was talking, nobody could even imagine a pandemic. So we made we paid the ten percent to kind of solidify our house purchase, and we were going to move over in May. And then the pandemic happened and the borders were closed and uh, we had to wait until July and we didn't know if we could make it at all. And then the horse uh, was transferred before I was, so she had to live with someone else while she was waiting for us. And it was just, uh, it was a huge, um, very chaotic, but I'm glad we're here now and I'm glad things are calmed down a bit. So anyway, it's good. good to be here. Um, okay, and so John Drury is um, saying hi. Lovely to see you and hear you. Um, it's nice to hear an American pronouncing Norwich correctly. Is it is it <laughs> coincidental that Matthew Fox has a book coming out about Julian this month? Mind you, I'd go for yours any day. He oh, thank you, John. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, John. And then Michelle's question, what are you working on now? Um, that's a bit, I can't talk about it. It's yeah. still in the embryonic stage and I'm working on a new novel, but it's still a bit too embryonic to talk about, but um, hopefully one day I'll be in conversation with you about it. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Sometimes you jinx it by talking about it too early. Yeah. Good. I'm yeah. a little bit secretive if it's still in its beginning yes. phases. Agreed. Um, Okay, so I think, does anyone else have any questions? I will say, everyone that's listening, you must go buy this book. It is incredible. It just is. And if you've had any inklings toward something spiritual, it doesn't matter what it is. Like Mary said, she, um, you know, meditates and she has a spiritual practice. Um, then it, there's a whole element of feeling like a woman stuck in this life and pushing back, like I said, against all of these outside elements when you desperately, desperately want to follow your heart. And um, so it's so modern and fresh at the same time. And yet you'll learn all these details about this older world that is so compelling and interesting. And um, I, I can't say enough good things about it. So please order the book. It's worth every dime, every penny. So um, Mary, you've done it and you've done such a fantastic job, seriously. I admire Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Yeah. That was lovely. Thank, Thank you, you. for this incredible conversation and insight into the novel. I have put links in the chat if anyone would like to pre-order their copy of Revelations. And Mary will be sending book plates to both Excelsior Bay Books and Valley Booksellers so you can safely order from either location and get a signed book plate. Um, there's also links for Mary's other novel, Illuminations, about Hildegard von Bingen, and For Eve by Elisa Elliott. Which Yay! Is, we all make absolutely fantastic book club selections. Lots of meat to discuss. Uh, I wanted to let you all know this program has been recorded and it will be available on social media later. You can check Mary's page or the Lit Lovers page, Valley Bookseller or Excelsior Bay, and you will be able to access it on all those points. Um, and again, if you wanted to pre-order the book, which we hope you will, um, there are links in the chat box. You can just copy and paste them directly into your browser and it'll take you right to the shop. Thank you so much for shopping with your independent bookstore and helping support both Mary and Elisa's work. We can't continue to bring you these great programs without your support. So thank you very much for shopping at a brick and mortar store. Now, please check both Valley Bookseller and Excelsior Bay's websites and the lit.lovers.com website, which I just put in the chat box, and find out what we've got coming up. Our next Literature Lovers program is going to be on April 26th at 7 p.m. Central Time, and we're going to be hosting three authors of humorous fiction. Julia Claiborne Johnson, Catherine Heine, and Jesse Sutanto will be discussing their new novels. The event is free, but once again, it requires registration registration. So from everyone at Valley Bookseller and Excelsior Bay Books, I would like to say thank you again to Mary Sherritt for sharing her wonderful novel with us. Mary, could you hold the book up a little closer so we can see that beautiful cover image? 
There yeah, it it's uh, I, I'm really in love with this cover. Great. Yeah, it's gorgeous. And then thank you so much, Elisa, for generously sharing your time Welcome. today to be Mary's conversation partner. I'm so grateful to both of you. It's pretty inside, too. It is a very pretty book. So it makes a lovely gift. Don't forget Mother's Drop Day. Capitals. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> So I hope that we can once again host live events by the time your next book comes out, Mary, and uh, be in person once again. So thank you all for tuning in today. We hope we will see you again on April 26th. And thank you for supporting Valley Bookseller and Excelsior Bay Books and the works of these fine authors. Thank you and a happy reading to all. Thank you. Thank you.